Hello and welcome to Stamscapes Lab Live. We have a piece of eight and a half by eight and a half um, wood grain paper here. And I hardly ever work in squares or I don't know, any other type of format than um, rectangles, although I always say that I should. I should cut some ovals and rounds out too. And uh, I don't know, just as far as 90 degree angle types of formats, the square could be a pretty dynamic, um, I don't know, whatever format to uh, do your scenes on. And there's certain things that you can kind of do to emphasize the, uh, the I don't know, whatever, the symmetry, uh, you know, between um, all of the different sides here. I'm going to, I have a little area marked off right here uh, with a little piece of chalk and I'm going to put, um, it could be, it could represent either a sun or a moon in here. And I'm going to do this very um, static um, composition in here between a light source and kind of the, um, I don't know, whatever, visual kind of landing point of the scene in terms of a, a figure in here. A lot of times I'm doing more kind of um, rule of thirds types of things or doing things a little bit more kind of offset um, for, I don't know, kind of compositional reasons. But um, occasionally I do do um, kind of real, I don't know, whatever balanced uh, pieces, um, you know, for the sake of it, you know, dramatic balance, but um, but not very often though. So I'm going to try that on a fairly large square piece. I'm doing it fairly large because um, I want to fit more of those desert um, objects in here and I want to have a variety of them. Okay, so I haven't done that in a long time. I don't know if I've ever done an eight and a half by eight and a half, but Let's do a piece of the Clayboard Smooth here. It's um, the clay-coated hardboard panels here. And I haven't done one of these in a long time, so I figured, eh, I want to try them out with the desert um, scene. So you can use this the same way you would use any type of, oh, like a semi-gloss or matte almost kind of glossy type of cardstock. You can just stamp on it and have a nice hardboard panel. But I'm going to be using it with some subtractive types of tools here. Well, two of them. These two are the same right here. But they're scratch board nibs or scratch knives, they call them. Scraper tools. And then I have this one uh, tool called a fiber brush um, by Ampersand Art. And... Uh, that kind of works like a little eraser, so you can do these um, kind of fun subtractive marks in there. Um, and it's because of this clay surface, you can't do that on like a matte piece of paper or something like that. I'm just saying that you can use this, you know, without the subtractive types of things, but if you're gonna do subtractive uh, marks on something, it's gotta be something more along the lines of uh, like a scratch board surface. The difference between scratch board and clay board <clears throat> is that this is on a hardboard panel, okay? It's like masonite or something like that. It's a acid-free type of hardboard panel. It's not masonite, but that's what it feels like to me. And a scratch board is typically on um, like a Bristol board or illustration board type of thing. So um, this type of thing is a lot more permanent and it feels good to work on, um, a lot of fun. Okay, so anyways, let's start off with this larger piece. Hello, Linda and Candy. <coughs> I've been looking today for that paper you sent me. Any idea where I put it? Uh, yeah, check underneath uh, your uh, your uh, glossy uh, um, metallic paper. <laughs> Look in the uh, your your corner of your craft room underneath. Uh, you know that one. Uh, I don't know, whatever box. <laughs> it sounds like the thing that I'd be asking people. Except I ask you, where did I just put that thing that I had one second ago? Okay, so let's do this. Um, let's, I, I don't know, I, I guess I can do it at any time. I'm just trying to think of, okay, do I need to stand, you know, do this little, you know, orb up here in the sky right now, or do I do it later. I'm trying to think if I need, you know, any reason for this to, to dry first right here. Okay, let's see. 
Um, let's go about right here. So I was thinking about going like perfect rule of thirds, you know, except centered on this one. But I, I, I thought, nah, that it, it brought it down like this orb like down here, and that's a little, going to be a little bit low for me. See, I'm doing this kind of pyramidal type of um, structuring in here, so it has this really firm type of... Um, oh, kind of visual balance, I guess you can call it, uh, from a structural standpoint, compositional uh, structure. I really like doing that when I'm uh, doing things like um, pyramids because it reiterates that, um, you know, that that shape of the pyramid or a triangle, you know. I do this kind of really, found, you know, foundation thing like that. Or these squares are really good for circles, too, if you do something that kind of involves kind of a, I don't know, real kind of balanced... Uh, I just heard something fall in my room. Just checking to make sure it didn't fall in the trash, because that's where it sounded like it fell. <clears throat> okay, but anyways, gosh, I, I think I could, I don't know, I can probably count on two hands um, the number of square compositions I've done throughout the years. Actually, no, maybe I take that back. Speaking of um, clay board or stamp board, there was this one size four by four um, that was kind of like a coaster size, and I think I did a lot of compositions on that size. Um, but as far as paper goes, not, not very many at all. Okay, so that's going to be our little orb there, and okay, so I'm stamping on the pre-printed wood grain paper here, so I'm going to use my hybrid ink, which is, I don't know, it's, I, I think it's my favorite ink. I haven't been using it for very long, but it's like, after I did a couple impressions with that, it's like, oh, I really like that look and coverage. And I, whatever, saturation on this type of paper, including the, uh, that goes for the vintage paper too. Sometimes, you know, when you're stamping on this uh, type of paper, I, I keep saying this, but some people might be tuning in for this. Um, these this video for the first time but um these papers here the pre-printed papers like this that have textures on it or you know the aged looking ones those are all printer inks that are layered onto the uh the surface so um it doesn't accept inks the same way that like a bare piece of cardstock would because it's coated you know already with a with an ink on top of it. So, so sometimes, um, you know, making an impression um, with certain types of inks, it just doesn't transfer the same as it would on a bare piece of paper, you know, non-coated type. So while this isn't like a glossy coating or anything like that, you have to take into consideration, um, you know, how these types of inks will, could potentially resist that which you are trying to, you know, transfer onto it. So in other words, if you get this type of paper or any types of papers, if you're curious about it, just do some test prints on a scrap piece and uh, test out, you know, different types of inks or maybe the first ink that you try on there works perfectly and you can just go with that one. What you want to see is um, how that ink transfers onto it and if it dries, you know, at a, at a reasonable rate. You don't want something to transfer on there, but it takes two days to dry or something like that. Okay, so I'm going to do this um, this character right here. I've been wanting to use this character in this desert type of situation. It's the old man and dog. So there's going to be this little corridor right here. Okay, I'm not going to make it like so obvious, but um, I'll just kind of have some imagery out to the side of it, kind of going back into this um, compositional structure. Okay, so this stamp right here, speaking of impressions, I'm stamping and holding this down. Maybe this will be a little bit higher up here. Um, but I'm holding, stamping and holding for a little bit longer. And then when you lift up, you know, you'll get a lot of that ink transferring. Not all of it transferred, but a good deal of it did. And that's, I don't know, 85% gray or something like that. 
I'd want more like 90, 95 ideally. It doesn't mean though that it'll be a, I, I mean, maybe like 90% of the ink to transfer. It still might look, you know, somewhat gray or something like that though. Okay, so lead up like this. I'm stamping this one a little bit higher. Hello, Bugs and Bill. Good to see ya. Hopefully no bad flood. No, no bad flooding here. I, I don't know. I looked at the news and uh, it looked like there were some cars underwater in some areas around uh, Southern California. That, of course, that's where all the news stations are all going to go to and broadcast it, but it might be like one block, you know, and amongst, you know, millions here in the area, but that gets the coverage for sure. But that being said, yeah, it was a pretty, it was a pretty good amount of rain. Nothing crazy here. Thanks for asking. Okay, so we have some rocks right in here, and, huh, you know what? No, okay. I was thinking about, you know, one of these is what I'm going to do is I'm going to do these rocks. And if you do kind of a serpentine type of um, thing, it's really uh, cool because you make kind of a visual pass. So what you do is you come like this and then you come over like this with these rocks. And then up here you go like this. So it makes like this natural corner and you can get up there. Okay. But when I went like this, I said no, because I, I want to make this a little bit more of an obvious, you know, kind of opening or whatever corridor for that figure to uh you know to go up you know and into that area uh, i think the big rain is coming though on monday um nothing extreme though like a what was it a couple weeks ago one and a i don't know one and 1.27 inches or something like that, which is a lot for around here, and it's supposed to rain like all week, but uh, nothing too crazy as of now in the forecast. Uh, I love it when it rains, though. I'm not necessarily a rain person, but if you've been living in Southern Cal your whole life, you know, you know about. There's nothing worse than like going on like the fifth year of like, you know, under average rainfall or something like that and, you know, having to really, you know, worry about, you know, having enough, uh, you know, precipitation, you know, for all the reservoirs and things like that for everyone that's out in this area. All right, so let's see, let's go like this. I'm going with the smaller ones right here. Um, blotting, uh, blotting off and going for a little bit of a lighter impression right here. That's quite a bit lighter, but I'm gonna have a tree, you know, in front of it, so I need to have it lighter so it doesn't interfere with the silhouette of the uh, um, the shape of the uh, the tree in front of it. All right, so let's see. Let's go with another one. Right. <laughs> I got. I have to keep my kind of uh, my bearings on. Um, Kind of the compositional shape that I'm going after here. Okay. All right. All right. Setting a foundation, right? Now that I look at this, if I ever do this on a white piece of paper, this would this could like be a kind of a cool like a stream or something like this. Um, you know, with these rocks. Okay, let's go. I'm gonna go in darker with this one, but I don't know, just kind of oscillating that a little bit. Dark light. Dark right here. Hello, Debbie! All right, 
what I mentioned, Debbie, is I haven't done a square composition in a long time. I'm going to do a couple things tonight that I just haven't done in a while. All right, so we have a little bit of a larger piece, I think, than, that, than what I've been kind of playing around with with these desert images. Uh, you know, I've done some half pages, and this isn't too much bigger than a half page. Um, but I'll have a little bit more space in here to uh, kind of play. I thought about, there's so many things I want to try. You know, I would say it's never a bad thing to have like, you know, just this endless um, kind of array of things you want to try out, experiment with. But I'm beginning to wonder, uh, maybe there is too many. <laughs> because right now I want to play around with, um, there's glow in the darks, right? Um, those powders that I got recently. I, I want to play around with more of that because I did that... Um, ocean scene recently with that one where I, you know, I flipped off the light in one of my little videos that I posted. And I thought that looks pretty cool, you know, like a bi that bioluminescence that we were talking about in a previous um, live stream. So I need to play around with that. The glitters for sure. I want to learn more about that. You know, I'm starting off from like nothing, knowing nothing about that as well as the glow in the dark. And then the, of course there's, you know, more of this desert imagery um, that I want to explore. I'm having, like I said in previous videos, I'm having, having to uh, rethink, you know, some certain types of, um, I don't know, whatever, stamping, maybe specifically compositional um, strategies. that I've just kind of, I don't know, they're a little bit ingrained in terms of how many images you use in a scene or how close you put things or how compact you put them. Besides textures, I'm talking about like main images, like trees and things like that. So I'm still adjusting to that. You know, see those rocks back there don't interfere with the silhouette. I mean, there's rocks back there. You can barely see them now, but... Um, uh, but... Anyways, having a little bit of that texture back there, I could maybe I see like that. I, now I'm thinking, oh, I could I could put like a lot more of those ones in there, you know. Where I don't know, I don't think I would do that uh, in other, I don't know, whatever biomes or something like that. I mean, those deserts are pretty full of stuff, and it's usually kind of prickly, <laughs> you know, and something to avoid. So when I, I do a lot of off-trail hiking, if not all of what I, you know, just about everything that I do, a huge majority of it was off-trail. But in the deserts, you know, you're often walking down like a, like a sand wash or something like that, because every square inch of, you know, the other areas are all kind of filled in, you know, nature... You know, nature uh, takes advantage of uh, kind of any open area that it can find. So in the desert, you know, it's like yucca and, you know, choy, the places I'm hiking at, choya cacti and, you know, this thing, I don't know what the official term for it is, but this bush called cat claw. It's got like these like claws on it that look like a cat, you know. Very scratchy out there. You don't go out hiking out there in shorts. <laughs> okay, let's try the, okay, so a couple Joshua trees in there. I'm gonna put my organ pipe cacti in here. Again, I'm gonna try to keep this little corridor fairly open for my figure to come in here. It's gonna be somewhere like this. Okay, so I don't wanna block anything off down here. Um, I want to leave this opening for the, uh, you know, the character to enter like that. I should keep that right there as I do this. I 
I don't know if you'd ever see these uh, organ pipe types of cacti uh, near um, Joshua trees, but uh, who cares? Uh, this Joshua trees, I always find them up at like 4,000 feet of uh, elevation most of the time. See, like, even if you go, like, I don't know, 100 or 200 feet lower, it's just like there's none there. I don't know what, what it is about that 4,000. I That was my th working theory for a long time because I'd see that all over, at least in California. But then one time I went over to uh, this area called Big Bear, and there was, I don't know, these larger style types of Joshua trees, and they were at much higher elevation, so it kind of destroyed my uh, my theory. Laguna Canyon, uh, oh my gosh, yeah. No, not built to ha handle that type of heavy rain. I think a lot of the, uh, they were saying a lot of the, um, the flooding that took place down here in certain areas of San Diego, I don't know, whatever it was, two weeks ago, or, um, it was just one of the, uh, the drainage areas were, uh, I think it clogged up, so I don't know. They had like three inches in a couple hours or something like that. And uh, I don't know. You know, the city's doing whatever all around, and they just didn't get around to uh, unclogging it. So just a bunch of the uh, residents in the area, they just, you know, teamed up and went down there and, uh, you know, cleared out a bunch of, uh, you know, the drainage areas. Okay, see this right here? I'm leaving this open in here, but we're getting some nice um, kind of silhouettes and foreground in here. Usually that would be my... Uh, things like reeds large or something like that. Um, but out here... I mean, you could still use that, but going to something like this is uh, looking pretty good. This is a fairly large um, image, but you know, on this eight and a half by eight and a half, um, it fits in there pretty well. Like so. Hey, Candy, what year uh, was that uh, when that uh, house next to you washed out? Yeah, do you remember? All right, here's a smaller organ pipe. Let's see. I have to kind of keep putting this little figure here because um, I don't want them to, you know what I mean? If I have them way up here, I'm saying that all of these uh, things over here are pretty small. But if you have them down here, you're saying that they're like gigantic. So kind of want to, you know, this organ's probably, it's not going to be like, you know, 10 feet tall. So you have to have it lower than the figure up here. So I'm thinking something like that could work. Um, or I could put a Joshua tree here instead. I'm wondering if this one is too full of an image for that. See, this one's more spindly like this. So, but I think I do like that here. If you're ever kind of uncertain about something, just kind of hold it up next to it and see. It's especially for um, like little critters or something like that. A lot of times people tell me when they start off with scenic stamping, um, it's the scale of things that they don't quite, um, if they want it in kind of realistic scale, um, you know, don't, let's say this was a lake in here, or a pond or something like that. They're saying, well, okay, um, I'm not sure where this kayaker should go. And they're looking at it like this, and then they're looking over here like this, back and forth like this. But what you do is you just put it down here like that and just kind of move it around. I have it on the block, but you can just take a piece of, you know, the rubber and just kind of make it more visual, you know, as far as what, you know, how you want it to uh, be. If I say, if I put it real low, I'm saying that it's really close to us. So that would be like a really huge tree. And if I put this here in the 
background like that, you're saying that these trees, you know, are shrinking, you know, as you're moving this up higher, you're kind of lowering the size of, you know, your objects in here by um, kind of relation in Western perspective where things higher represent things farther off, okay? So uh, just make, you know, hold the thing up, you know, that's what I do. Otherwise, it's kind of theoretical instead of visual. What is the name of that group, rock group? Uh, I don't remember. It's only in that set. I, I, I forgot what I called it. I just, I don't know, I named it and... Um, I don't think I called it... Did I call it rock cluster? It's, that sounds like a, something I would name something years ago, but I don't think I, it might be called Rock Cluster. But it's like, I don't know, after using it in this set, it's like, oh, that thing works so well. It's like, I, I want to, I'm using it for everything now, it seems. Uh, like on um, the uh, uh, reflection cards, you know, having something down below on that area. It, it just works perfect for that, too. And, a, you know, any type of whatever biome, pine trees or anything like that. And it seems to be working out really well. Okay. Got this biggest organ pipe there. And let's go something over here. I do want some more Joshua tree in here. That maybe, and I can go for the smaller organ pipe right here too. See, I, you know, I'm just lining things up right next to it, um, so I can kind of get the gist of it like that. Because you can, you can kind of see how that looks. Now, some people stamp out things on, um, like, uh, um, what do you call it? Not mylar, but, um, you know, transparencies and stays on ink. And then they compose that way too, which is a really great idea as well. Um, you know, cause when I put that there, it's really going to be that way. So I don't know if that'd make a huge difference in terms of what, you know, your selection would be, but, um, you know, again, just make things nice and visual, make things, uh, and that, that makes for a nice, easy kind of, um, You know, whatever compositional, uh, whatever solution for you. Or it'll get you much closer to kind of having a good idea of, you know, how something is going to look. Okay, I'm looking to see if I, I forget about the, uh, I mean, the, these other, um, I think that would look really good right there. The uh, Ocotillo there. All right. So this Ocotillo is really kind of spindly, right? So I can have something that's fairly large or high, tall in terms of scale, but it's still kind of, you know, it's real spindly and light. So you can kind of, you know, you can see a bunch of stuff in back of it still. You know, it's going to mean obscure these rocks right here, but it's not so heavy of a, you know, a visual weight, I guess. Maybe that's it too, you know. I, I said, you know, these things are kind of more narrow and you can see through them. So I guess that it's the visual weight of um, like these desert types of, uh, you know, flora where you can kind of really cram them in. Um, you know, without kind of just uh, overpowering and uh, kind of throwing off the balance, the visual balance of a, of a scene. Okay, so I have that kind of shape over there, so I'm going to put a little bit more on this side as well. Just something like that. I just need a little bit more of that shape somewhere else in here. Maybe, like, see? Like behind in here, too. I'm going to throw this in here. So it's not like reading as an Ocotillo, but then you have this kind of that little shape right here, here, and here. 
and this is like a trio like this working in here um, and then let's go for this right here it's smaller so I'm just saying it's roughly on the same plane as this so they're the same distance but I'm just saying this is one's like a, a you know a smaller um, version sometimes you know you get these areas out in nature too it's like um you know, there might be like a really small tree or something like that, especially in higher elevations. And it might be, let's say for just for example, there might be, it might be four feet tall or something like that. And there's another one that's 15 feet tall, not too far from it, but the four foot one's a lot older. It's just, you know, slower growing, less water, whatever. If anyone ever goes to, um, I think that's the case where, uh, like I've been, uh, those bristlecone pine forests, the oldest living trees, or uh, oldest living thing in the world are. I think on one of those signs it was just saying, you know, hey, so, you know, some of these, you know, really small ones, you know, are, you know, some of the oldest. Which maybe that's good up there because um, something's like, you know, whatever, thousands of year old, um, you know, the taller the thing is, you know, the more chance of it getting hit by lightning uh, happens. All right, so anyways, getting our corridor going right here. Hello, Sharita. Good to see you. Hope your stamping's coming along nicely. Your exploration into uh, rubber stamps in general and crafting. <laughs> It's, it's fun to hear um, anyone new kind of just, you know, kind of, ex, you know, f discovering, uh, you know, the paper arts world in general, or just, I don't know, whatever, crafting in general. All right, so we need a little bit of filler in here. I, let's go ahead and stamp our little figure in here now. Okay. And then I'll kind of work around it. I wanted to have, I didn't stamp it yet because if I stamped it higher, then it might change, you know, what I, you know, how I want to place some of these things. I wanted a little bit more flexibility. So if I stamp something like this and I have a Joshua tree that's like right next to it, you know what I mean? It would look, it would look kind of weird. You know, I'd be saying that, well, there's this like full grown looking Joshua tree, but it's like, uh, you know, three feet tall or something like that if I did it right there. But I think I have enough stuff in here now that I'll, I'm going to stamp this one out. And then I'll, any additional things that I have in here, I'll just work it around where I, you know, place the, uh, the figure. I mean, you don't have to work that way or anything like that. And you know, just on this one right here, I was kind of playing it safe because I just haven't done this, uh, um, like shape in a while and it's a little bit larger I haven't been using these stamps for very long All right so if that's our figure in there like I was saying like a Joshua tree I'm gonna put it like out in the distance like you know at least higher it doesn't have to be higher than the stamp you just have to have it higher than you know, their um, height, you know, the the base of their um, object in here. So if you have this right here, it's higher than, you know, them, and it looks like it's out in the distance. But if I put it right here, you know, I'm saying that that's, you know, I don't know, whatever there, he's on top of a horse. So what is this like, you know, seven, eight feet tall or something like that. Okay. I mean, what, which would be fine for that, you know, the, this tree right here, but you know, they're usually a little bit higher, so I put them a little bit higher like that. Okay, so let's do that while I have this one out. Rock cluster, large and small. Okay, got it. Thank you. I probably won't sell them separately. It would be another 
problem with that is um, anytime you sell, I mean, I do that. I mean, my last grouping of stamps were all individual, but the problem is, is that um, sometimes, you know, you don't want to have like one, um, I mean, in the old days, you, what you do is you have one stamp per one plate, okay? And that's so that, you know, when things sell disproportionately, you know, from one another, um, you're not stuck with a bunch of um, stamps off that same plate um, that are just like excess, you know? Or even if you sell like a left and right side of something, it's like, I don't know, there's no kind of rhyme or reason. Well, I don't know, there might be, but um, they just don't sell at the same rate. So if you ordering, you know, from if I'm ordering rubber from my rubber guy and, uh, you know, it costs a certain amount per plate to get that. If you're only selling like one half of the imagery out of there or whatever, something like that, but it still costs you the same price, you know, the entire plate. So you, you know, so what you want to do is you want, ideally you want to be able to group things together, but um, uh, sometimes it's not very practical um, to do it that way. It just, because the, you know, the cost of uh, like magnesiums these days are so high. I did that video just recently, if you guys watched that one, it shows the, the mags. Uh, the etchings and they're very expensive so um, I don't know like if I did these in two sizes right here these two rocks that would be about in startup that would be let me see that would be 250 it'd be about $300 just to get it into production so you have to really sell quite a few of those just to pay for the plates so I give these to people like that and they get it like it, I don't know. Even if you wanted just those two things, if you liked one other thing in there, it would cost the same amount, you know, as like one, you know, buying the entire plate practically. All right, let's see. Let's go for some smaller imagery. So that's the, uh, that's the, uh, that aspect of uh, rubber stamp production. It's not as easy as just saying, you know. <laughs> all of it like that, which you used to be able to do, but there used to be, uh, you know, a lot more stores around than there are now that, that would order it. Okay, let's see here. See, I'm doing all these really lightly like that, and then that it's given, given me this, um, kind of this corridor right here. Now, I don't want to close it off like that, because I want him to be able to kind of enter in through that area, if, I, if possible. So, let's see. By the way, um, so on this wood grain paper too, one of the things I didn't mention was, um, you know, there's always, there's, you know, a pattern to the paper. And I chose this side right here because there's this little bit of a darker grain running right through there, as opposed to right in here. And I figured that, you know, that orb is gonna stand out a little bit more against that darker piece right there. I mean, it's just one of those subtle things. I mean, you could have done it that way, but see that white there isn't gonna show up against this lighter area. So, you know what I mean? If it's, if you have a little bit of a choice like that, you know, as, as far as little kind of uh, design kind of uh, uh, decisions, you know, it's, uh, those little things can add up in the end, as far as like little subtle, super subtle types of things. Okay, so let's see here. Let's add in a little bit more foliage or texturing in here. This is like my little brush at uh, after getting that first, um, playing around with the first uh, batch like this, it's like, I need something a little bit more. I need something like bushy, you know, like sage or, you know, something like that. And it just, I don't know, whatever, like ground cover stuff. Cause it was looking too kind of flat in there. And like I said, in the desert, you know, 
it's like any type of kind of open real estate basically gets filled in with some sort of um, brush out there. Everything wants to always, uh, all the things are uh, like taking advantage of uh, whatever photosynthesis, you know. Okay, so let's do that. But I'm leaving this open right here for a little bit of a visual path, okay? Uh, let's see. Oh, should we read a practice today? And let's just say back to the drawing board. Uh-oh. You got to send, uh, send me uh, photos of uh, what you did. Was it a compositional thing or was it a media type of thing? Media compatibility thing. Do I say hi, Patty? <laughs> Hello, Bonnie. The video of the stamp making with the mags plates. Oh, yeah. I figured a lot of people don't know about the little things like that, you know, and why, why would you, you know? But I don't know if anything like that is out there. So I'm trying to record a lot of like just rubber stamping history stuff. Did I mention I'm going to try to get to Roberta from Rubber Stamp Madness in, in, a, in an interview? It's like almost there is so little kind of rubber stamp history type of stuff out there. Um, there's been a lot of, um, things like, um, like conventions, um, that, uh, are no longer going on where there's, um, no kind of documentation of it or very little stuff like that. Definitely companies and stores that were around, e like even like, um, now, Stampa Barber went out of business a long time ago before, you know, everyone had a camera on their phone. So there's, you know, I could see that, you know, there's just not a lot of um, kind of the history of, you know, something like that. But you'd think there would be something that was like the largest um, kind of entity, uh, retail entity of rubber stamps that will ever be. Um, that company, that um, Stampa Barbara in its day, they pretty much carried, um, if there was, stamp, you know, some stamp company around, they pretty much carried their line. Maybe it might not be the entire line, of course, but um, he, you know, prided himself in, you know, trying to get just about every, you know, a, a full representation of the entire, uh, like, industry in their stores. And that I, I found one photo of their store and I contact the owner because uh, you know he has this um photography uh, studio out in uh, Palm Springs now and he didn't even have photos of the place I'm thinking what the heck you know there that used to be like rubber stamp mecca where everyone like take a pilgrimage you know up there by adding these swaros by the way <laughs> I needed something in between this and that background uh uh Joshua Jury. So here's like this nice narrow kind of imagery these days that we can use in the saguaro, you know, cacti. Actually, that looks pretty good. Maybe I'll, can I go for another one right here? Uh, but yeah, 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 you know, things like, you know, just like a rubber stamp production or anything like that, like that PSX one, you know? And I, there's not going to be any like video of anyone kind of talking about their... Um, I don't know, whatever production methodology. So I thought, eh. It wasn't a really great example of it because it wasn't, you know, it wasn't one of one of their kind of their types of stamps that they're kind of known for, but I didn't have any of them, you know, besides the uh, that witch that my mom sent me. Or, I don't know, what not didn't send me, but, it, you know, she was getting rid of. <laughs> Okay, so here's another piece like that. I don't know, that kind of goes up. Looks like it's coming out of the um, organ pipe cacti, but oh well. 
I'll put something in between there. Okay, so anyways, so see these little types of things like that. I would never have done like too much like, I would never have that, that amount of uh, stuff in there. But I don't know, if you go to like those little botanical gardens or kind of walk through gardens like it, you know, things and it's like cacti out there. Uh, there's like a botanical garden, I think, in uh, what, what's it called? The Living Desert or something like that out in Palm Springs. I haven't gone to it, you know, because I'm hiking out in the desert anyway, like all out there. And so I see that stuff in the wild. But, um, you know, it, it kind of looks like this, you know, with a bunch of stuff. Did Candy ever say when that uh, flooding happened out there uh, with that house? I was just kind of curious to know if uh, um, what roughly year that was. Because I taught at the, I was mentioned in the past, I taught out in the, uh, I didn't really, I lived in Huntington Beach, was, you know, really close to Laguna relatively speaking, but I just didn't have a reason to go into Laguna too much, you know, so I never, I rarely head down that way. Sometimes I'd take a drive down um, PCH down south, you know, all the way to, uh, I don't know, whatever, San Juan Capistrano or something like that, but not too often. Um, and never stopped in Laguna Beach, but, but I taught uh, a class out there one semester while I was doing Stamscapes, um, just in my free time that I didn't really have, but um, it was this college out in uh, Laguna Canyon called the uh, Laguna College of Art and Design. So, you know, so I saw that area in, in that canyon area, at least. Okay, so seeing those little textures in there like that so that kind of filled it in a bit i think i'm going to leave that up there I, we can yeah i don't know we can do like some mountains or something like that up there too i'm not sure if i want to though stay tuned you know i don't have a lot of backgrounds like you know i've been using that other kind of deserty looking you know those like buttes um but um I want some backdrops in here, so I'm working on that right now. It's probably the, th I don't know, third and final desert kind of um, imagery set. Okay, so we have that in here. What time is that? Where are we at? Eh, 47 minutes. So it's like two scenes, you know, it's like this is like a half page scene right here. A little bit more okay but that's the biggest thing of doing it on this type of paper for me i don't add too much color you can you know but i do it minimally with some uh just some colored pencils but let's just anchor things down a little bit more so this is going to be a fairly decent um you know light source uh black colored pencil here black prisma color I'll go down like this, and I'm going to transition this. I'll make it a fairly decent um, kind of shadow coming down this way. And then just, you know, going back to these rocks right here, I'm going to have to work around these bushes that I've placed right next to them, too. But let's, okay, now see this right here. I don't want to have my shadow darker than the image, okay? So this is going to be a really light shadow for those really light impressions. Same thing goes for anything. Don't make the shadow darker than the object itself. So if it's just in straight black, it goes, you know, darker light as you want. But um, with the lighter, more distant objects, don't, you know, lay down too dark of a tone. It, would, uh, it wouldn't uh, kind of match. It wouldn't match the value of those um, objects in the distance. Okay, so see something like this right here. I mean, it's not real tall, right? So you just kind of do, you can do like a little um, shadow at the base of it like that, okay? So it kind of anchors down our little uh, bushes here a little bit more. Let's see, here's some rocks right in here. 
I just go, usually, I, I mention this all the time, but um, I usually just go for a really light um, shadow at first. I mean, it might not look complete, but I just do the lighter version on everything, and then I just darken more accordingly. It's like, okay, that can use a little bit more. Um, and then I just go back to it, as opposed to, like, developing one completely, you know. Or developing one to completion, I guess you can say. So this way you can kind of get a feel for how things are looking on the overall when you add these types of uh, little details in. This one right here, this is like going to be like a really tiny detail because you can't see them, but on this little rock right here... Okay, so if this is our light source and there's a rock right here, then I have the uh, shadow coming like this, but if the rock's over here, okay, it's at this angle right here, so I put the shadow more like that, okay? And if there's one over here, you know, the opposite, you go like that right there. So everything's kind of, you know reiterating kind of the lighting direction right there. I mean, it's subtle, but you know, I don't have anything like really tall right here. It's going to be cast in a really long shadow. I could do that cast a longer shadow like, you know, with this Joshua tree right here, but I filled it in with, you know, it's filled in with other types of textures like that. So, you know, we don't see that. If I was doing like a like a Halloween scene or something like that, or, you know, like a spookier scene. I wouldn't fill in everything in here. I'd have, like, these Joshua trees, like, right here. Let's say this was a Headless Horseman or something like that. I'd have these trees out here where I can cast, like, a really long kind of shadows. And I'd, I'd probably put this, like, lower or something like that. And I have these really long shadows because longer shadows can be really dramatic. Okay, let me see what, uh, let me see, reading the chat board here. Um, you can't do without the rock cluster anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's what Linda said. Stamp me, uh, stamping on different types of papers too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so Sharita, yeah, that's the thing there. So um, just kind of learn the, um, every, you know what you ought to do, Sharita, you know, with whatever media you have, do a little test print of those different inks on that paper and just kind of write down uh, the one you used on there. And uh, one of the things you might do on your inks, um, you know, starting out um, is uh, just write, like on the back of it, you can say something like water-based or something water. Um, if you have an oil-based ink, write oil or um, you know, whatever else is there, alcohol inks or something like that, you know, and that will tell you kind of, um, it'll, in, it, it, with, with a lot of different surfaces, it'll inform you on what's going to be compatible, um, with that surface. Now in something like this, um, the wood grain paper, I don't know if I've tried like the, oil-based pigment inks on here, which could dry, but it might just dry slower. Okay. I'm not sure, but then, but then when you get into things like foils or something like that, as far as I know that the ones that I've tested, you can't use any type of um, oil-based media that will dry on those types of surfaces, okay? Uh, I don't know. I'm still figuring out those things myself, though, too, yeah, with a lot of things. Okay, so anyways, there's our kind of their anchoring down like that with our shadow work in there. It's nothing ex like really extreme. Um, but then let's see. Okay, so I have a nice white light source like that. So I'm going to add in some little highlights in here. I want to see if I can use this with any degree of uh, finesse here in this open area. And I'm going to try to illuminate um, 
a little bit the area around our subject matter so that they're like in a little bit of a you know, kind of spotlighting like this really to emphasize them uh, or I don't know whatever their spot within kind of the stage like that and then we'll try to do this little corridor of light so like on these rocks right in here um, you know I'll have a little bit of lighting hitting them you can do this with a with any white media. I don't know. I tend to think that this um, kind of this pastel pencil is pretty good because you can really manipulate it. If you add too much, you can just take your finger and just kind of wipe it off. Okay. So when you get what you want, um, spray fix it. You know, to lock it down. Okay. So it's these little highlights like that. These ones are on the. the left hand side of the earth I, I don't know i put that on there that's a little bit too light like that but the rocks on this side of the uh the light source should be kind of right or uh, yeah right side illuminated this is a rock this little bit of bush i'm going to try to illuminate a little bit of that like like so though Let's see. Put a little bit of this right in here too. So a little bit here, here, and here. Okay. Uh, let's get a little bit more here. Okay. Let's see this cacti, this organ pipe. This organ pipe is already kind of illuminated in the design, so I'm just kind of reiterating it a little bit. See, it looks kind of weird like that because I don't have it on any of the other um, foliage in here except for this ground cover right here. So the thing is you have to kind of balance it off a little bit with um, some highlights or that same type of lighting on other objects in here. So let's see on maybe a couple of these saguaros right here. You kind of have it on the... Uh, you know, the right side illumination. Here's the um, Joshua tree. Let's put a little bit on this Joshua tree. I, I, I added too much on um, one of my vintage papers the other day, and I just, um, it was just a little bit too much. So I just, I just basically just removed it after. It was after the live stream. I think I did it in the live stream. I see this organ pipe right here kind of disappears you can see a little bit um in front of this rock behind it so you just kind of put a little bit of highlight you know not to highlight it all but um if you put a little bit of highlighting like that it kind of pulls it out from the background a little bit same thing with this one right here you can do something like that here's this one right here and again there's that rock right there that's obscuring it a little bit so you can just put a little bit of a highlighting like that onto it i don't know i might be kind of i don't know so some of this you know there's a lot of stuff going on i don't want to like separate all of the images too much because it'll start looking too busy so i don't know let me just tone some of this down where it just has some subtle lighting on it like that Okay, so I want most of that lighting to be contained kind of within this area right in here. Anyways, here you see something like that. That sky is still looking kind of, it's empty. I'm going to put, I'm going to leave room up here, possibly for like a boxed quote or something like that. You know, where you stamp it on a separate piece of paper and then place it up there. I think something like that will be good. Um, but yeah, and, and I'll think about, um, I don't know, that. that other mountain stamp might look pretty good in there like this uh, I'm gonna think about that one though it's this one right here see this right here but again it would be like this I can do that really lightly should we do that right now let's just do it right now I don't want to go back to this later <laughs> okay so let me see. Sharita said she tried grayscale. Awesome. Are you researching the history of card stamp? No, I'm not doing that. 
that would be, Patty, that would be too much work. <laughs> I'm just kind of, I, I wouldn't do, I'm not researching anything, okay? Um, I'm just kind of trying to, I don't know, whatever post um, stuff that I have, you know, it's like rubber scent madness, you know, doing those flip throughs. Um, just showing some of the, the companies that were out there, the manufacturers at the time, or some of these flip throughs are of magazines that are just no longer around. Okay. So it's stuff like that. It's stuff like, you know, the manufacturing process. There's barely anything about that at all. Um, I don't know what else, you know, I don't know. I, I linked to that, you know, I've done it before. I think though, but the rubber, st the, what is it called? The, I don't know, the rubber stamp museum or something like that is by uh, Picasso Gaglioni. Um, he, there was a video that was done probably in the eighties or early nineties or something like that. Okay. So there's a little bit of a very faint, uh, mountain range right there. And I'll put another one of piece of it right, right over here. Yeah, but I link to that and I have like a, I don't know, rubber stamping. What do they call it? Rubber stamp history. I don't know. Something like that. Rubber stamp history or something like that. I have this album and my Flickr. Now, Flickr is not an active community. I mean, it used to be. It used to be the place where a lot of um, photographers shared their photos. But there was like some, you know, I don't know. It looked like in, like in the early 80s or something like that or mid 80s, like these people getting together and doing like stamping. I think it was like, I think it was overseas somewhere like Germany or something like that. You know, so I started, you know, I mass that type of stuff in like my own album like that. And that looks better. Um, so stuff like that, but I'm not like actively going out and like doing research on something like that, like card making. I mean, you know, I've never, that's, uh, that's, that would be a subject for like, you know, someone to like write a book over you know, or something like that. There are probably books on it too. I think I have like a, a few books on that, like greeting card tools and techniques. I'm looking at my uh, book collection right now. Let me see if I can put a little bit of lighting on this. But I, yeah, I want to, I want to get a little bit of this history, you know, rubber stamp history kind of locked down. I mean, it's not like a long history. Um, you know, if someone was stamping in the eighties or something like that, that's going to be like a really, you know, long time stamp. But occasionally you come across someone that's, you know, it's like, oh, I started stamping in the seventies, you know, and it's pretty rare. You know, first of all, there weren't a lot of, um, like art rubber stamp companies at the time, uh, doing that. I don't, I don't know when like rubber stamp, uh, uh, rubber stampede and all night media and those, um, those companies got started. I think it was like sometime in the early seventies or something like that. So I think I have a set. Um, but yeah, uh, there, there wasn't a lot of, uh, there wasn't a lot of, uh, like sources for that type of thing going back. So I don't know. I think we can get like a pretty good history of it. Okay, so anyways, there's some um, mounds like that. I think that looks better back there. It gave it a little bit more scale. I don't want it to. Too. So I'm kind of having, trying to have this white kind of muted out a little bit because I want the lighter area to be in here. I don't want the attention going up here. And when you spray seal this, all this white is going to get darker. So I might have to kind of give it a little bit of a touch up if I lose too much of this kind of more delicate application in here. All right. I can't see anything else I need to do in here, but I, I still kind of like the idea of uh, some sort of um, word stamp or something up here. Oh, I forgot about all my little critters though. Let me see here. Has anyone here watching, has anyone been stamping since uh, 
Did anyone, did anyone, anyone ever buy any stamps in the 80s here? Uh, that's watching. I was just curious. Even if you weren't like a rubber stamper at this time or something like that. Uh, I have a set from, I think it was All Night Media. I think I did a video of it. I think, oh yeah, I did a video called my first um, stamp set. And it's of these little space creatures or something like that. And I posted that up one time and um, I didn't know what the company was, but you know how the internet is. Someone, I don't know, they did some research and sent me a link uh, to it. And I, I bookmarked it, but I think it was on an old, um, an old computer or browser or something like that. So, and I can't remember what it was now. But I'm pretty sure it was an all-night media um, stamp. Okay, there's my little cactus wren. Um, let's see. Um, but yeah, that that probably came out in the uh, or maybe the mid '70s or something of that sort. The weird thing about that thing was. I think when I shot that video, this little tiny ink pad that came with the stamp set still worked. And I haven't, like, you know, I've never re-inked it or anything like that. So <laughs> if that was the case, it was definitely an oil-based, um, you know, style of ink. That's the only thing that's going to be, uh, you know, still, you know, moist after all those years. All right, there's a little scorpion, um, horned lizard here. It's like one of those little um, highlights books or something like that where, um, you know, there was like that one picture or something like that where people have to kind of, if you have to find, um, you know, those little things <laughs> that there's a chart for. Oh, Bill's got a lot of PSX books, yeah. Botanicals. Now, the thing, someone, I was reading on, um, I tried to do a little research on that one, but when I'm talking about research, I entered it into Google, you know what I mean, over the, and just did a little search on that. Um, I forgot what I was looking for specifically um, this last week, but, so I didn't know PSX, like, had in... I don't know if it's in-house designers or something like that, but they talked about um, the designers for PSX because I was never quite sure if those were, I you know, I knew some were original just by looking at them, but some of them I didn't know if they were, um... okay, I think that's enough critters right here. I have four in here. We have the cactus wren, the horned lizard, the scorpion, and the um, tarantula right here. I was going to squeeze something in right there, but... <laughs> And I don't want to do this um, tortoise right here, just walking across. That's the only place. I don't, I don't want to put like three of them in a row, you know, together like that. But I think the two, you know, like insects down here are fine. Although, that'd be kind of cool having that road runner back there. Like that. No. I need this path a little bit clear right there. Okay, so anyways, we have that like so. All right. And I'll frame that off and I'll come up with a quote stamp um, kind of later on. But let's let's do this. Okay, I'm going to try to speed through this one. Maybe I'll go with the same type of composition so we can do a little compare contrast type of thing. It's smaller. Okay, it's five by seven. Clay coating on here. Clayboard um, Smooth by Ampersand Art. It pretty much takes any type of media you want to work on there. You know, um, people use oil paints, pastels, um, oil pastels. It's just a, it's just an art panel just made for just about anything. You can do ink on there, of course. I'm going to do, let me see, I'll do it with the dye-based ink. That'll probably just dry the fastest for me. I'm going to get a background going in here first. And um, then I'll just stamp my images over the top. But do I want to go vertical? Let's go horizontal. I'll be able to fit more things in that way. 
But um, I'll be doing some, I'll show you what, you know, some subtractive marks look like on this board and, you know, the, the fun you can have with this. It's a little bit of a different mindset knowing that you can do subtractive marks on there, strategic, you know, um, subtractive types of applications or subtractions, I don't know, wait, you know. Um, so sometimes you, you add down a little bit more ink um, this way. Okay, when you add stuff to this, I mean, we can't remove ink that you've already applied. You can remove the pastel, but you can't remove, uh, you know, things that have soaked into the surface of the paper. But on this thing, you can. In fact, if you just do everything on here, you apply everything and you decide, if you're working with like inks like this and you decide, oh, I don't like the whole thing. You can just sand the whole thing off, just provided you don't sand, you know, through that clay surface and you can just start over again. Naturally, it's going to be a little bit thinner if you've sanded into, you know, some of the uh, the clay, but, you know, it's a <laughs> it's an uh, incredibly forgiving um, type of uh, surface to work on. Okay, so I'm just going for these little kind of wispy kind of um, textures in here. Uh, hopefully it kind of look like a little bit of like sky or something like that. Uh, this doesn't have to be monochromatic. You can use colors or something like that. And maybe I'll tint this one here. See, I've been talking about that. Maybe I'll get out add a little, little bit of a, like a warm tone or something like that in here. Um, so because this is a subtractive type of, you know, capable surface, you can do things like um, sandpaper, steel wool. You know, there's all kinds of tools you can use um, on this uh, type of material too. So um, in their kit, they have um, like their multi-tool kit from Ampersand. It's like a piece of steel wool. So when I was working with them developing this thing called stamp board, you know, which was just basically smaller pieces of this, you know, for the stamping community, you know, for use with like to make ornaments. And so a lot of people made jewelry out of it. You know, the, the inches, the one by ones. Um, okay, what was I about to say? Um, but yeah, you can, I don't know, you can use all kinds of things on it. I forgot what my main point was that I was going to say. Oh, 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 the steel wool. Um, I asked uh, Elaine, their CEO, you know, at one of the shows, I said, hey, you know, what? Steel wool? Uh, why, why are you... I don't know if they sold that separately or something like that, too, or if it was just in the kit, but I thought it was kind of, uh, kind of weird. You know, it'd be like... Yeah, why, why are you including like a paper towel in the kit, you know, or something like that? But they, they explained to me, oh, because most steel wool, when you buy it, it's infused with oil so it doesn't rust. But their steel wool was not, didn't have that oil in there. You know what I mean? So if some artist was using it and they wanted, uh, you know, some water-based surface or something like that, they didn't want to have, you know, they, they don't want to have um, like an oil-based type of um, tool that they're applying over the top of it. Um, yeah, it might discolor or something like that. I don't know. I have no idea. So that was interesting. It was interesting working with a, uh, an art, you know, supply company. They're like the, one of the, I don't know if they're largest, but they're, they're probably the largest art panel company. I don't know. If it's not the world, probably nationwide, it's really amazing. And it's not just clay board, it's, it's pastel board, it's gesso board, it's, uh, um, you know, black clay board smooth. That, there's cradle panels, you know, which have like this board out here. And you can order these things, like these panels, like, I don't know, you can probably order them. 10 by 20 feet if you want, you know, and they'll, they'll make it for you. Um, but there's some really large um, panels out there. So it's just like a canvas or something like that, but these are panels. So a lot of um, painters, you know, sometimes they paint on panels, they just sew um, some board or something like that, but 
these are pre-done they're like super smooth so that being said they're you know their um, museum quality um, and archival like fine artists use them so when they were doing um, those um, stamp board pieces those smaller pieces for um, the crafting community it was the same material it was just smaller so I said hey you know if you guys like have end cuts or something like that you know we might be able to use them you know for people that were like using like domino sizes or ATC or something like that if you had like end cuts then you can you know you can use them and sell them in the uh, the crafting community and I don't know if they ever did that they said I think they said oh, that you know they'll just they're not doing like scrap pieces you know they're you you know they're just cutting it down from the master panels that just makes it you know faster for them okay so anyways that is our background like that so it's really smooth and easy to work on it it's kind of like working on a piece of uh how, i would say it's less absorbent than a semi-gloss cardstock so I'm able to drag this a little bit easier maybe because it's not absorbing in quite as much. But I mean, this is like completely dry though because it is clay and clay is going to be very absorbent too. But let's add a little bit of a tinge of uh, some other color in here. Um, if I do have something, let me see what I have here. If I had a pale brown, that would be awesome. I mean, you could do multiple colors too if you want to, but... Um, see I need to get some more distress colors I went through them so fast I just didn't feel like I haven't repurt out oh, here here's a pale orange here Marvy pale orange that's a real dull kind of beige here uh Debbie has a few old PSX stamps PSX gosh anyone know what happened to them you know besides closure the stamp was made of metal and was put into wood somehow that's interesting patty because see that's see die cuts um are usually metal in wood um so I wonder if it was like some of that type of, um, you know, production or something like that, because like, you know, like metal stamping or something like that has been around for a long time. And, uh, you know, maybe that same tech or something like that would be, um, you know, what we were talking about or with, uh, with that stamp that you saw. It's pretty cool though. Okay. So here's this, this is, can you see that it's a little bit of a warmer tinge like that but look at that I wiped off that black ink over there it's because this is so wet here I guess let's go like that all right so a little bit of a warmer tinge like that okay I have to think is this up and that down or is that up and that down I don't know can't tell I I think this is up yeah that's up right there because I just made that darker up there like like that all right so let's do let's do something on this let's stamp some imagery out again let's go for some of these rocks because I can't live without them just like Linda <laughs> hello Susan good to see you I was a kid what do you mean in like the 70s okay uh you, you're talking about when I got that uh image or that set I was a kid when I got that uh I think that all night media set and I, pl I played with it I used to you know stamp it you know occasionally not too often though and I don't remember where I got it from either I'm just glad I kept it though where is it Oh, it's right behind me let me see okay so I'm just going to use the same ink on here but I mean you could stamp you know other ink in here
Okay, so we used to get C's candy all the time, right? Not all the time, but um, that's the, my stamp set right there from, I think it's All Night Media, but here's just this bare wood, like this little handle like this, okay? And it's just the bare rubber on there. You know, they probably, I don't know if they stamped it out or something like this. Okay, here's that stamp pad right here. Okay, and it's just like a little bit of felt in there. Let me see something. It's a little bit. See, I, there, it's still a little moist. Can you see that right there? And the, I don't know. This is like from the like the mid '70s or something like this. They don't make them the way they used to. <laughs> and I think I got this other um, alphabet set too. So this is just like hard rubber up here, and. Uh, it's, it looks like, I don't think it's mounted. I don't think this lettering is mounted on there. It's just all a part of this, all rubber. And then they got some kind of like stamp, probably a hydraulic stamp and it punched it out, you know, like that. So I think I got these two things at the same time. This like this eyelash is a, you know, thing right here. It was like wearing like fake eyelashes and wigs back in the seventies, you know, or something like that. But, um, so this rubber right here too, 100% red rubber, I'm sure. Perfect. It's still like supple. I can feel it, you know. I can tell when a you know a piece of rubber is kind of dried out. But uh, that one's just still fine there. Okay. So anyways, I didn't need to make that impression that long, but this. Okay, I just shifted this over because this block is a little bit small for this. Okay, I'm going with a smaller piece. So I'm going to stamp these a little bit lower here. And let's go for this. I like the shape of this organ pipe cacti, cactus. with bats in front of the moon. Uh, that'd be a good idea. I studied a book where I have sample of different things and write notes like you're talking about. That's cool, Bonnie. I always think people, it, having a, like a note book or something like that is always a really great idea. I don't do that anymore, but I should. Yeah, the mountains helped out, huh, Candy? It, there was just too much empty area up there. I mean, which is perfect for like a like a word stamp or something like that. But it's almost like so much space that I want to have it on a separate um, thing. I'll I'll kind of I'll put a quote stamp up there. I'm gonna mat this on like a piece. Oh, maybe I let me see. I might have to cut this down a touch. I'm gonna mat this on something and then have another piece on the outside and do the same thing on the inner. Um, quote, you know, stamp on here. But let me see, I'll have to see if I have, I, can, I shouldn't work in eight and a half because um, I have like my eight and a half inch stuff to, um, my papers to, uh, you know, to frame it off with. I don't have a bunch of like 12 by 12 or anything like that. Okay, here comes the organ pipe. I hope there's going to be something in here for me to scratch into in terms of the, uh, you know, some highlights. I'm sure there will, but I'll figure it out. Stamping on this is a really, it's a really nice experience too, um, to stamp on like a board like this, something that's really stiff and it, and like I said, clay is something that's really absorbent, so it really takes your inks really well. Um, it's just, it's a surface that's designed to take as many different types of media as possible. You know, in the art world, you know, they're thinking, you know, art media. So it's, you know, it's all whatever types of paints, inks, 
but um, along with that, it's dry media too. Now this surface is a little bit smooth, so it's going to take things like graphite and pen and ink and all that really well. I don't know how, how well it's going to take something like um, like pastels, but then they have pastel board for that. And then I don't know what aqua board is, but they have that. Let's put a little bit of this over here. I like to repeat um, things within a scene whenever I can, even if it's just a little like bit of it like that. Now, let me go for another one out here. I was going to mix and match, but maybe this is just going to be a whatever organ pipe cacti national monument or whatever it's called i don't think it's a national park i need to take a look at that again okay so we'll put um let's see this is like that black and white uh, type of um uh whatever that video that I just did this last week you know see this right here I mean there's like an area of light up in the sky right and then it's separated here by a little bit of darkness and then you have an area of light down below like that I mean it's happening right here too but we just kind of created the light you know I haven't put a bunch of tone in here but we made this light up here and then you have light source up here and then light source down here or reflected light down here but I just broke that up, you know, three times. I didn't want to have this whole thing like, you know, like it's water or something like that all illuminated. So if there's like a big area, sometimes it's just bisected a little bit like that. But it's still, that's your light source up there. And this is going to, you know, represent the, uh, the reflected light on the ground. Okay, let's see. So simple lighting, okay? And... You don't have to do that that way. There's a lot of ways you can do lighting. And there can be a lot more sources if you want. But you could also, like I was mentioning, my big point about a lot of this lighting stuff is that you can keep it really simple and you can do it for practically every scene, you know, that you're doing. And it's the same kind of, you know, concept or idea structuring. Um, anyway, that, that's what I do most of the time. I mean, once in a while, if I'm doing 11 by 17, there's like, you know, something illuminated over here and over here and over here just because it is such a big scene. But, um, you know, when am I ever doing that? <laughs> Hardly ever. Okay, here's some smaller ones in the distance like that. All right. And... I haven't used my, I don't know if I've used my bighorn sheep yet. I was just looking at this and if I did a rock out here and that bighorn sheep up on top of it, I don't know if I have like space for it though, unless I put it on top of these rocks. So here's the same rocks down here and they would represent something really close. But if I put it up right here, it'd represent, you know, something like farther off in the distance, but ju they're just larger, you know, in scale. Yeah, do I do that? I could do this in the background too. That would really fill in too much space though, I think. Uh, huh. oh, this thing has glitter on it. Everything has glitter in my room now. This is really tempting right here, looking at this. I think I'm going to try it. The fact that this is a live stream um, kind of gives me a little bit of pause. <laughs> 
which happens, you know, in these live streams sometimes. It's like, uh, do I want to tr like try this in front of everyone? Okay, so here's my thing right here. You know, when I was putting it right here, I want to stamp it dark enough. I don't want to do this one like really light. If I'm going to put like some object on top of it, I want it a little bit more solid, but I already have my objects in here. So I don't want this to be super dark right against these, you know, cacti in here. So I'm going to have to do this, figure out where, you know, I'm going to have to have them a little bit lighter at least. Okay. And I'm going to have it transition a little bit lighter here. So it's going to go from dry to wet in here. Okay. And I want to get it, oh, I don't know, whatever. I mean, it's not so precarious. I mean, you can kind of, you know, you can wipe off a good deal of it. But see, I, I need this part right here to be, you know, fairly dry. But I don't want it so dry that you can't, like, make it, make anything out either. So, okay, that's wet right there. So I think we're doing that right here. Okay, well, we'll see how it comes out. And it is stamp board, so if you do go a little bit too dark, like you said, you can almost kind of scratch it off a little bit or, you know, define things a little bit more. Okay, well, see, it came out fine. I don't know what you, were, you guys were so worried about. <laughs> but you see what I mean? So I just dabbed that off back there. See, if that rock right there was that dark, it would obscure, you know, this cactus right here. I, I guess I didn't need to wipe that one up, but I, you know, I didn't, you know, know how far it was going to go over there. So, yeah, I think it looks fine. <laughs> okay, let's see here. My, uh, the my mystical beast here. I think I've come across... I've come across the bighorn sheep about th three times out there in Joshua Tree National Park. One time I was just by myself. Maybe a couple times I was by myself and saw him. Another time I was with some friends. Yeah, I just kind of remember every time you saw him out there because they're just so, you know, you don't see him out there very. Let me make sure that I have this mounted up. Uh, yeah. Mounted uh, straight. Because the back legs are a little bit higher than the front, so. All right, there we go. I just wanted, I had to get that one in there. I haven't used that one yet. Now I've officially used all of my desert images, I think. Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't, actually, I don't think I used this, uh, this skull, cattle skull yet. Okay, so let's add a little texturing in here. Okay, so we have that right there. Oh, by the way, um, when you, um, if you, on this board here, so we use, I like to use um, spray sealants, you know, on my scenes, but on this one right here, I like to go with a really thick layer of spray sealant um, as it, it really puts this like glazed, kind of like a fired tile type of look. Um, it gives them a, that feel to it, you know, like a, like a tile, like a fired tile or something like that, you know, like a ceramic filed, fired tile. It's really uh, pretty cool. All right, I have these rocks right here. I'm gonna put a little bit more cacti behind that, I think. Okay, let's see.
Okay, Sharita has a lot of the photo. Yeah, that's that's the main stamps out there. These there's the clear uh, are the clear ones. Debbie's first stamp purchase was in 1995. I've been broke ever since, but rich in in uh, creative spirit and uh, overall kind of uh, outlook. <laughs> right, Debbie. <laughs> 95, that was right, you know, when, uh, that was definitely right when stamping was, you know, getting a lot of, uh, just generating a lot of, uh, you know, momentum out there in terms of, uh, you know, the hobby. It was, it wasn't just, it was, it was stamps, but it was all the stuff that was being kind of developed for the stamper as opposed to kind of repurposing other types of things to be used in stamping. It was like stamping specific stuff. So, you know, you had clear snap coming up with all these uh, different types of things. Um, oh, I don't know. What else was out there? There were so many different types of inks. Um, I don't know. What else was out there now? I think about it. That, in the, that was in the mid nineties. So you didn't have Oh, okay, so like like videos or something like that, like VHS, you know, instructional videos, you know, by D. Grunig and stuff like that. And then I think you started seeing, um, I think by that time you started seeing it on like, uh, I don't know, people, do people know Carol Duvall? You know, that show um, was uh, broadcasting, um, you know, stamping related content. Uh, with D, you know, again, like that. Okay, so we have our foundation right there of uh, cacti and everything like that. Okay, so this is on stamp board. What I have here are scratch tools. Okay, these are the same thing. It's just that standard, you know, style of uh, like cal uh, calligraphy nib. It's, these aren't calligraphy nibs right here. It's just a metal nib. It's by Speedball. Now, there's different brands of them, but there's not a whole lot. Um, Ampersand Art doesn't make their own, but they get, um, they have a, a couple different ones in their kit. This one that I like is kind of like a little spoon, okay? And um, I'm not really using it as a tip. There are ones that look more like a spear, and um, it gives you this one complete uniform line if you want like a really you know, specific line. Let me see if I have one of those here. Yeah. Okay, so this one right here is just this flat speared tip. Hopefully you can see it on your screens there. And this one's the spoon like this. This one right here gives you a little bit more of a varied edge. It's like you're kind of scraping back into the piece, but I can use a different part. If I, if I go more vertical, I can get kind of a more narrow line. And if I use the side of it, I'm just kind of it's almost like, you know, just getting a, a wider type of removal of medium, okay? Or media that's on your scene, in this case, dye-based ink, okay? So, uh, and this one right here can give you this kind of this really soft removal of ink. I almost kind of liken it to like a broom or something like that. And it's tiny fibers like this, okay? They're all fiberglass fibers that are in here and they're all tightly bound into like a little point here. It just does a very light, delicate removal of media, okay? It's like you're sweeping into this. So sometimes, you know, a lot of times when people have got this, um, in my classes, I always tell them, you know, what, uh, what not to do, but they do it anyways, okay? So they think that nothing's coming off by using this like this, okay? Or very little, okay? So they kind of, run this out like this and then these are fiberglass fibers and they've they you know um expose too many of them like that they, they think they need to do these things just start breaking off okay so it has to be really tight like this um ampersand art always keeps changing the uh, the format this was the second format um that i think no the third one i think there was a blue one that was metal and i think this is this might be the one that they've kind of arrived at and kept. I'm not sure, but okay, so let's do this right here. So this is going to be removing media right here. 
And what I'm just doing is I'm just kind of adding in these little whiskey whisks, you know, of uh, like light into the area like that. I'm kind of doing a little bit too much here, but I just wanted to kind of show an example of it. But this is where I can kind of give these real kind of, uh, I don't know, whatever textured types of applications of... I don't know, what are forms in here? Okay, now normally I'm doing this as an additive type of um, process with things like white dye-based inks or paint pens or something like this. But this is one that you can give a really kind of soft, you know, type of removal of something or, you know, super, like, delicate um, application of you know, whatever type of shape you're going after. So in here, you know, in the sky, I want this really kind of light, airy look, you know. I mean, if someone wanted to do, you can do kind of more expressionistic types of things too, where it's like a hard kind of look on there, you know, too. So this isn't just like, this is the technique that you do, you know, or something like that. It would be like, you know, someone trying to explain to you how you should... Uh, apply your paints or something like that with a painting it is you know it's there's no rule or anything like that you know there's different types of things that you can kind of start off with as a you know things you can do but um inevitably it comes down to you know whatever you want to you know the thing to look like so this right here um you know just that real whiskey Look, let me do something like this too. Um, I'll have little whisks like going off into the air like this. Like a... What type of cloud is that? A cirrus cloud that's real wispy, you know? I forgot. The more light you want it, you just kind of stay in that area and kind of add that in there like that. So it kind of gives a little bit of movement like that. If you ever take off too much, or let's say I wanted some of that warm tinge up in that area, you can remove your black ink and you can tint those exposed, you know, plain <laughs> areas of, uh, of the board again too. So you can do like strategic types of additions of color here and there where you don't really see it if it's over the top of black, but then you just remove some of those black like that, and then you color those areas in like that too. So there's all kinds of things that you can do on this, uh, you know, with this type of um, process like this. I'm going right over some of this cacti right here because it's, it's fairly dark and it's not removing, I mean, it's probably removing some of it, but... Um, it's not removing so much of the cacti, though. Okay, let's do this. So this is giving me a little bit of a, I don't know, it's like a little bit of visual movement. Or it could be like, like a breeze in the distance like that or in the background, you know, throughout the piece. Let's go down here. Let's have a little bit more lighting. Uh, here, I'll have a little bit more lighting right in here. You know, behind the big horn. Like that. So see, we have a little bit more lighting up there. I'm just doing this for an example here. And then what I'll do is I'll just expose a little bit more lighting down here with that reflected light, okay? So it's almost like you have the ability of... Uh, um, to erase ink, you know, which is quite a formidable, you know, formidable ability, uh, which we normally don't have in stamping. You know, once you get that ink down on a piece of paper, that's it. So what happens a lot of times is um, people will see something like this. I'll just say, you know, this one's done on stamp board or something like that. And I, re you know, I had that area, re you know, down below illuminated by removing the ink with this tool right here, okay? So they'll say, hey, Kevin, I tried that out and it didn't work. And I'll say, well, you know, um, what media did you use on the stamp board? And they'll say, well, I just, 
you know, I tried it on a piece of paper, you know what I mean? But the thing is, it's not going to remove because it's not that clay medium like that that's designed to, you know, for a subtractive process like that. And when I say clay too, it's not like a fired tile, you know, of clay. This is a soft kaolin clay. Again, it's like more like scratchboard clay uh, that's on there. But you see this right here? You can illuminate certain areas that you want. Okay, now see right up in here, it's all kind of darker like that. Um, let's just expose, uh, let's, let's put light back on the top of this rock right here, okay? Now I'm using this tool right here, but I'll use my uh, scratch knives in here too. So it's just like removing a little of that. Let's get a little bit of light on this rock right here. See that? See so now illuminated, you know, the tops of those rocks right there. See this rock right here? You can re remove some of that ink like that. And now you put a little bit of light in. If you ever take off too much, you just ink it back up and just tone right into it or you can color it or whatever. I usually don't do so much removal with this uh, tool right here. I'm usually on there with my scratch and I see this rock right here in the, um, the top of it. Let's bring some light into that one right here. Basically what I'm doing, I'm just, I'm just illuminating areas of the, uh, the designs that are all already kind of illuminated, but I just stamped them over a darker background. So here I'm just able to reveal the lightness of them um, you know after the fact so like that see that our rock down there is now kind of capturing some of that light we have some rocks right over here You almost think of this like a as a, like an ink eraser. Um, but only on this type of board again. Okay, so see this right here? See how those objects in there are uh, a lot more illuminated now? This one right here was kind of obscured. And uh, it's like a little passage of light in there. You're gonna try to. <laughs> Sharita's, uh, Sharita's, uh, Sharita's open for anything. You know what I mean? Isn't that fun though? So you see all these different types of things. So Sharita, you can do, uh, you know, all kinds of different things on here. Remember? You know what I mean? Don't just do it the way I'm doing it. Um, you know, play around with it too. Um, hey, Harold, how are you? How are the how are how what what's the temperature in Maine right now? Okay, let's go with the uh, the scratch knives like this. So this spoon one um, here is like this shape like that. So you, what you're doing is you're using that scooped edge and you're kind of removing ink this way, okay? So I can just go for a really sharp removal. I mean, not, not as sharp as that, you know, this real pointy one right here, okay? Let's see this right here. Well, I'm able to get right on top of that rock like that. Uh, Harold, you, Harold and Linda. Linda's Harold's wife. Um, I taught at their class. I mean, at their store. But uh, Harold, we did this in uh, we did this in your store, right? With the uh, with the stamp board. I would have thought I taught that there. But I'm not sure. Okay, so I'm going for much more kind of like targeted little, you know, subtractive little scratches, you know. 
on my objects. You know how they talk about, what is that type of um, stamping or coloring where they say it's, uh, is it lineless or something like that? You can scratch out your lines here if you want to. Like I said, if you ever kind of remove too much, you just, you know, you just add that tone right back over the top of it and just, you know, uh, start it again, or you can tone in with a little bit of a lighter tone or something like that, or... Like, uh, here's an example. If, if I was doing the scene up here and I had like a moon or something like that, let's say the moon was in... It was a warm moon, like a slightly dim yellow moon or something like that, okay? And let's say the landscape down here was cool colors or something like that, okay? And I was toning in with blue tones or something like that. Well, if you add yellow over the top of blue, it's going to look green, okay? But I can scratch all these little areas off like this and expose white, okay, within a blue field, you know what I mean? Which would be hard to do if you're just inking in on a white piece of paper because you would have to specifically leave out all these little white areas like that for the application of that, you know, dim yellow or something like this. But this is, you know, something that you can do on the board after the fact, like I said, and just put it very, you know, whatever other color very specifically, you know, in the exact places you want it. You know, because all leaving all these little areas like this with a you know like a spongy technique would be a you know kind of a little hassle. All right, so there's that. See this rock right here? I didn't even see it, you know, because it's all in darkness. Now I don't want this one to be like white in here, but um, let's see. Let's do a little bit of removal like this on it. Okay, so it's just like a really dull version of removal like that, okay? Let's see, it stands out a little bit more. Let me give it a little bit more of a, you know, very narrow kind of little highlight like that down there. I don't know if you can see that right there, but see how that rock kind of stands out a little bit more? Okay, now maybe going with this spoon shape on the sides of some of my um cacti in here is going to be a little bit too wide so that's when you can switch off and go to something you know more narrow and precise like this so say so i have my lighting coming from right in here so maybe on the sides of some of these organ pipe cacti i can put a little bit of lighting it's kind of a real mellow light in here it's not like it doesn't look like it's something like super bright and crisp so i don't want to do something too extreme here but I'll see if I can kind of add in a little bit of highlight onto some of these right here, especially where, you know, the object is in front of something that's a little bit darker like that. So, I haven't done this in a long time, so... I was doing this sketchy thing right there for a minute, but I think this, like, just the scratch is working out pretty good. Here's this right here. Oh, I like this look right here, just kind of on the tops of it and going down. See, like that right there. So let's do this right here. But see how that, you know, you get those silhouette types of uh, objects like this, and you can really make them look a little bit more three dimensional this way. Yeah, it looks a little bit better. Or pretty cool. I think it looks fine without it too, but... Yeah, see that like that? I don't know. Can you see that right there? Those little scratches in there, they're very narrow. Like that. It gets a little bit cluttered in here, so let's 
bring a little bit of definition like this. All right, see that right there. Um, so this uh, type of this um, this clayboard smooth in smaller pieces like uh, inches and ATCs and domino size. Um, those ones are called art. I think it's called clayboard art tiles. Okay, if you're in the U.S. Uh, uh, stars like Dick Blick are a really good source for it. Um, um, but, uh, you know, a lot of the larger kind of art stores might have, I, I don't know if they'd have the, uh, the art tiles they'd have, they'd carry the ampersand panels, but I'm not sure if they would have the, uh, you know, the smaller art tile, um, types of products. Um, I haven't checked in a while, but yeah, I don't know, you can check that out. Okay, now see right over here, I stamped this object over the top of that one. It was kind of dark, so it looked like it was over stamping it. So I, all I did was I just kind of scratched in the silhouette of the closer organ pipes in front of that. So it brought this organ pipe right here out a little bit closer to us visually by doing that. All right, so hopefully you can see these little highlights in here like that. Yeah, let's go with a little bit of a real kind of a defining edge scratch on some of these rocks, just maybe on the top surfaces or something. You can't see it right here, but I have a little bit of this kind of little sketchy type of look in some of these um, rocks. It's almost like cross hatching. I'm not trying to do it, but I'm just kind of doing these like small scratches here and it just, I don't know, it's just coming and kind of coming out that way. So maybe I'll just kind of go with that. I'll have like more of these little textural forms like this in some of these areas. All right, let me see something here too. Okay, is this... I'm going to tint... Or maybe I should... I forgot I, I didn't use that ink on here. I used the uh, the Marvy Black here, dye-based ink. And also when I used some of the... Uh, that pale orange, it removed some of my ink on the side. So I'm going to add... I'm just going to tint some of those scratches a little bit you know, some of the additional ink. I don't know if you can see that difference like over here. See how smooth it is? And then it's a little bit different over here. I mean, I think it's fine on both sides, but I think this looks pretty good too. It's like tinting some of my scratch lines back in it where it's more grayscale of a line. See those scratches up there are a little bit more grayscale now, and they're kind of smoother too. That 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 helped out uh, quite a bit. I haven't scratched in like I don't know, and I, I think it's been months, and probably before that it was like a really long time too. So I haven't done very many pieces in this in a while, but yeah. So I forget some of my little techniques or something like that, but. See, it's all things like that. I mean, that's a little like fun stuff. And and again, here's the uh, organ by cacti, those silhouettes in there. I don't know, I think it lifted it out from the scene a little bit, having those little, you know, types of um, highlights in there. And they're a lot more subtle too than, um, you know, even a, you know, 0.7 millimeter um, paint pen. You can use your paint pen in here too, if you want to, you know, you can, 
add a little dots or something like that. So instead of a subtractive type of um, uh, whatever addition, seems weird to say that because it's a subtractive process. But if you want a little bit of a different type of texturing, you, you know, in there, something like this too, monochromatic, if you wanted, I don't know, you wanted to do some sort of like real graphic statement, you can put in uh, whatever, yellow wildflowers in here or something like that, just, you know, as, as a textural kind of, you know, addition in there. It might kind of harmonize pretty cool with that. Let me, here, I'll add in some little white things. So, you know, that subtractive process gives me a little bit of a different texture. Maybe I can add in some of these little highlights like this, or these could be wildflowers, like little white ones in here. Like I said, this this board this panel can take you know it can accept just about anything you want in terms of media um, including your oil based types of um uh, media because i knew that i knew they do i know they do do um oil um oil paints on here so again it's not like you know like paper surfaces or something like that, you know, which are going to accept certain types of media. This one right here, it's clay, so it's, I don't know, it's pretty accepting of just about anything I that I know of. Okay, so there's these little types of things like that. If you don't like them, you can, you know, what do you do? You just scratch them off, you know, with your, with your tool if you want to. Or again, if you want to tint some of these, if it's a little bit too white or something like that, you can go into it uh, and tint them with uh, another type of ink. You just kind of ink this up and when these are dry, you just go in there and tint them with something. But we'll just keep this one right here monochromatic. All right, so anyways, um, yeah. This is pretty much ready to be spray sealed, you know, too, um, at any given time. I would, I'm gonna hit this one with a triple thick. I gotta get those glitter off though. How's that glitter? St oh, that glitter landed on there when that ink was a little bit wet, I think. So it kind of stuck to it. All right. Let's see. A couple of cats and letters spelling my name. One larger. Let's add metal on wood mounts. That's pretty cool, Candy. Have a vintage printer's tray. Now, what does that mean, Candy? Vintage printer's tray. When I, when I see that, I was almost thinking of the, uh, what is that called? The California job case for lead type. <laughs> you know? But I know that's not what you mean there. I love antique stores too, uh, Patty. I haven't walked around in one in a long time, though. I started walking around in... Um, antique stores back in the 80s or late late 70s when I was a comic book collector you know when I was a young teen because you're always like looking for you know those uh, types of uh, books out there never found any though we don't see the mistakes we want learn so go ahead and make <laughs> leap of faith yeah yeah, that rock turned out just fine, huh? Hello, Jeff. Good to see ya. Yeah, the scratch. So these are called scratch knives um, or scraper tools. These two right here, the spoon and that little speary one, these are by Speedball. Used to be able to find these really easy. They were in the, typically the, like Michael's, and they're in a blister pack, and it comes with two of them like that. And uh, I don't know, they were called scratch knives or scraper tools, but they would typically be found where the calligraphy um, tools were. I don't know if they are still in those areas like that, or if they're, I don't know if it's on Amazon now, um, but it was really easy to find. But I think I looked for it fairly recently and I'm talking about within the last couple of years. And um, it's like, oh my God, what happened to the, uh, the scratch knives? I was just praying that they didn't, weren't discontinued. Um, but I think they're still out there. Um, and again, it's speedball, you know, 
I think they make all those, you know, different types of calligraphy things too. But a lot of these things, you know, are discontinued. Like I can't find this Koinor um, cork style of a nib holder. I, I don't know. At the last time I looked at it, this, this one's like from Germany. I probably got this back in, I don't know, probably the 80s or something like that. But there were all kinds of different um, nib holders back then. And it, it seems like there's a lot more... It's limited now. This one's a, I think this one's a Dick Blick one right here, um, which I really like. I like that little contoured type like that. But um, anyways, on these things too, one of the things you do is you have to sharpen them up occasionally. So I have a little um, metal um, sharpening stone that I just kind of give it a little bit of a, you know, rub on. You don't want to do it too much, otherwise you're going to wear down the tip too fast, but it just needs to be honed a little bit. And then you just do a little bit of a, you know, you get that little edge off, you know, just like you're, you know, doing a knife or something like that, okay? But you keep it really flat. Or you can use like a, like a super fine grit of sandpaper just to hone this one. This one you never do anything to, you know, and it's fine. All right, Bill. Uh, Bill probably already took off. 28 degrees. Yes, we did. The, yeah, you did the clay board there at the, at the store. That was my Stampscaping 103 there. Glad you like it, uh, Bugs. Jeannie, how's that foot feeling today? You know, when did you hope that's coming around? I was going to say, now you have your own way of stamping and things like that. So when I was talking about like you can do much more of an expressionistic type of application, I was thinking of you. I was thinking you might have a, you know, do some stamping um, sitting down and see what, uh, I'm just kind of curious to see what your pieces would look like if they would look more static, you know, than your dynamic standing up, you know, types of uh, processes. Hello, Vengeance Scrap Girl. Hope you got your stamps. Um, just got your Oro. You just got them. Okay. Uh, well, I hope you have some time to, uh, you know, to... Uh, to to use them, experiment with them, and you're in the midst of uh, your busy uh, work life there. You guys want to see what this looks like with the uh, spray sealant on here? It'll just take me it'll, it'll take me two minutes to do. Let me go out there. I'm gonna lay down um, a coating on here. It's gonna be really wet, you know. Um, here, let me see if I can do something here real fast. On oh, I don't have this set up right here. I would have to re-ink one of my things. Okay, so the thing that I like doing, see this side of this right here, of these boards? They're really kind of boring as is. Let me see if I can do something real fast right here though. Um, okay. I don't know if I want to ink up my entire pad here, unless there's something already on here. Eh, it's probably dry, these metallics dry really fat yeah it's like bone dry here but what i do is i put in man that's a here let me do this i want to show you what i do here and this will make your boards your panels even if you're doing like really small pieces um it makes them look better i think for our card you know making processes here um I almost thought, this doesn't look like Starlight Silver here. It looks green. Do these inks kind of spoil or something? I don't know if I can do this. This looks like it's completely um, separated. Let me see if I can get this. Maybe putting some of this, it's just all like pure liquid here. Let me see if some of this liquid in here, I can see the silver at the bottom of it, but it's not mixing in. Yeah. But maybe some of this liquid right here will put this back into, you know, some of that dry ink back into solution. Yeah, I don't know if it's going to. That's silver, eh, it might be mixing. Eh, I don't know if it is. But what you do is you just take your whole board like this and then you tap it down like that and then you'll get, I like it metallic. Okay, so you can see a little bit. It looks more pewter though because my 
pad here is really dry and it's not applying. But see, that looks better than this kind of just bare nothing wood like that. But if you have it kind of shiny like that, it looks really cool. Let me get this applied here. Let me see, do I have another? I don't want to put gold on this one. It doesn't match the uh, kind of the gray scale. Okay. I mean, some people used to take um, like a silver paint pen or something like that and mark it like that. Or some people have done like silver tape or gold tape. And they put it around there and then they wrap it around flat so it has a little bit of a border. But if you do this with, you know, a decent pad and you go like this, it puts a little of that color on the front so it kind of frames it off a little bit. You might even kind of angle it slightly. Here, let me try to do that. I can see some of that on there. Oh, let me see something here. Now this is probably dry too. This is Platinum Planet. I've never used it because I like the Starlight Silver better. Oh, here. We might be in luck. <laughs> here. I don't want to completely pollute this uh, plant and planet, but we'll just do it on here anyway. Here. Let's see if we can get this on here. Yeah, see that silver right there? And if you get a little of it showing over the front of this, it's really kind of nice, so let me try it here. I don't know why this Platinum Planet, Platinum Planet I barely use, and I barely use the silver either, but that one really dries, but see that right there? So it really gives it a cool finish, and then if you mount this on something, you'll have this um, border on there. Okay, this Platinum Planet isn't super juicy, but it's getting enough to get a little bit of a coating on here. You see, you can't do this with a piece of paper, right? So it's one of those other things about having a three-dimensional type of thing like that, okay? And I don't know if you can see that right there, but see, it has a little bit of a border like that around there. I mean, if this is like really wet, you can really kind of emphasize that and get that around on there. But if anyone's still on, let me run out and I'll just bring this back in wet, but I'll show you this. Okay, so this is what it looks like, you know, pre-sealing. It's, you know, it's kind of got that satiny type of look to it, okay? And you can put this border on after you spray seal it too, but I just wanted to show you what it looked like. Um, you know, just absolutely complete. Okay, so let me run out and uh, I'll just bring, like I said, I'll just bring it back in wet.
All right, if anyone's still on, triple thick Krylon clear glaze. And this is my very wet, look how shiny that thing is, uh, tile here. I wouldn't handle it right now, but for the sake of this video, this live stream, this is what this looks like here now. Just glazed over. So it's a triple thick. Okay, yeah, you don't have to use a triple thick, but I would slather, you know what I mean? Which I would never do on a piece of cardstock because you don't want it to bow and everything like that. But look how beautiful that is. Okay, so they have like really small pieces. So, I mean, this type of stuff is really great for um, like Christmas ornaments or something like that. You can use like a little tiny square. Um, you can use them for embellishments that you put on top of your cards, stuff like that. Now, if it's like for a Christmas ornament, maybe you paint the whole back of it. Now, I'm not talking about this size, but they have those smaller pieces. But for Christmas ornaments, if you guys know what a cropodile is, you know, those punchers, that thing, that crocodile thing, that hole punch thing, cuts through, punches through this board, hardboard panel, like butter. It just goes right through with like no problem. It's really amazing. So you can do all kinds of stuff like that, but we use these like smaller pieces of this and you see you can put that glaze over the top of it. And it was like fantastic, you know, for kids projects because we made, um, like refrigerator magnets and uh, pins. You can get those pin backings for this or that um, um, adhesive style of uh, magnet stripping. You know, it comes in a big roll like at Michael's or, you know, Joanne's or something like that. You just put them on the back there and you can have these up there. You know, we've had one from my, when my kid made a, one in preschool and it's been up on the refrigerator all that time. But it's really perfect for that, you know. It's it's kind of better for that. You know, this is like perfect for that, um, more than I would say um, like a piece of cardstock, in terms of longevity or something like that. But um, yeah, I really like slathering my uh, pieces with a lot of that um, um, clear gloss like that. So uh, it's really fun. Let me see. Um, let's see. Glad you guys like it there. Hello, Sharon. Glad you like it. Need elevator music. Yeah, <laughs> I was thinking when I walked out of it, I was like, gonna, I should write uh, back in two or something like that <laughs> right there. Smaller clay boards, I'm gonna try something. Now these ones, she should be able to find up there, Linda, if you ever want like larger ones because it's, uh, you know, that ampersand art in terms of um, these panels, it's such a, a widespread, uh, you know, art. I don't want to put this down here because I'm not going to be able to pick it up again. So here, here let me do this something like this. Um, you should be able to find these panels. I don't know if, like, these five by sevens come in like a three pack. Um, I don't know if you'll. You, I would think you can find them out there somewhere. Um, yeah, along with you know other things like cradled panels and such. Glad you like them. So here's the other piece done tonight, by the way. I had so much fun with that, that clay board, though. Here's my other piece right here. I don't know. That one looks a little bit more dynamic. <laughs> you can do this composition on a... There's all kinds of different sizes of those panels. There's, it's probably 8 by 10. I don't know if there's going to be an eight and a half by 11, like letter size. It's probably more eight by 10, like what photos would come in or something like that. So you can easily find frames for it. Like, you know, the standard photography uh, sizes of paper. But um, I don't know, man. You know, every time I do one of these pieces like this, though, and I after I spray it, I think, yeah, that looks pretty good, you know, in terms of the formatting, you know. But uh, again, here I can't show you, see that, that silvery thing. If it was on the starlight silver, it'd be much more shiny though than that uh, platinum planet like that. But see that right there? 
I've even done it sometimes if it was like a blue winter scene or something like that. Um, I put a blue perimeter on there. I can't remember if it was with blue pigment ink, which it probably was. It could have been dye-based ink. It doesn't look like it because dyes are transparent and you got that wood showing through it, but it looks better than just the bare, you know, edge like that. And again, you can take these types of things and, you know, you can mount it on a piece, you know, on a perimeter board or something like that and make it into a card. It's a big thick card, but um, it looks really great, you know, kind of framed off as well. Now this is on a five by seven too. So they sell, you know, they probably have five by seven frames out there too, that you can just, you, if you want to frame these, you can. With these types of panels though, you know, if it's a frame, um, it doesn't necessarily need a piece of glass over the top of it, you know, because it's an art panel, you know, usually, if uh, an artist is using this type of thing, they just put those hangers on the back of it and you can hang this up. It's not like they wouldn't be doing that with a five by seven, but you know, those larger pieces, 40 by 60s or whatever, or their cradled panels, they don't have it in, you know, a piece of glass in front of it usually. Uh, okay, the spray again, Vintage Scrap Girl was the Krylon Triple Thick Crystal Clear Glaze. Um, now this one's going to be a little bit more, you know, kind of geared for the art, you know, pieces, okay? But if you don't mind it, and, you know, I don't know if it's going to change, you know, the, the look and characteristic of your piece over time, but you can go and you can pick up things like a, like a urethane spray, like at a hardware store, you know, in the, their uh, spray paint section. Or it might be in the stains section, I'm not sure. But like Home Depot or something like that has it. And they'll have like those thicker styles of spray sealant. They're probably not those, you know, going to be like archival and stuff like that. They're uh, non, you know, coloring or something like that because they're really made to, uh, those urethanes are for like, you know what I mean? If you, if you have outdoor furniture or something like that and you want to seal it off and protect it from the sun, you know, periodically or on a deck or something like that then you might, you know, use it, that type of thing. But um, but that'll give it a nice thick coating, though, too. Those urethane sprays are really thick, so you can use something like that as well. Or, you know, like I said, hey, Kevin, you know, I don't want to, you know, I'm not going to be doing, uh, you know, stamp board all the time or something like that. I want to get, like, a separate can for that. Um, you can just, you know, hit it with your Krylon, you know, UV clear or crystal clear, something like that, but just kind of hit it with a little bit more of a, a thicker slathering of it, okay? Watch for drips, okay? I have this flat and I just went outside and it was probably a really good time to do it because it's kind of cold outside. But don't have it kind of vertical where you're spraying it and uh, you don't want to get a drip on there because that can happen on those thicker types of sprays. So have it nice and flat and give it a nice even coating on there. I wasn't real careful about it. I just, you know, slathered, you know, like this. And then I just, normally I'm kind of hitting it in bursts and doing sweeping things like that. But if you want that really thick kind of glossy coating like that, like glass, then, you know, it's one of those things you can do on that board. But just don't take that same type of practice probably when you're doing it on like paper. <laughs> so you have to remember that, you know muscle memory, you know, the last thing you kind of did, you know, it might hit some kind of like a, you know, thin piece of paper, or, you know, card stock with that, you know, and if you hit it with that big slathering of that, like, it's probably going to bow or something like that, or it might drip or something. I'm, I'm not sure. Did you get a smooth? Sir? Yeah, it is. It's here. I'll show you right here, Candy. So see that right there? It's pretty smooth. There's a couple little things on there, but that was uh, that was on the surface. I think it wasn't the uh, it wasn't the uh, the triple thick. Now, I yeah, I one of the things I that I said it was it's kind of cold outside. So not this time, but I think in the past it has occurred to me that when I have done it on drier, warmer days, on 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 smaller cards, you know, on cardstock, when I'm just trying to give it a you know like a quick spray, sometimes I have gotten a little bit of a drip on it I guess I, I don't know I might, I might have had them kind of an angle you know so that I'm not spraying down with the uh you know the cans like this 
you know, because usually you have it upright like that. So it's easier if it's a little bit of an angle. And sometimes when I'm doing it, like on this one right here, you know, and I don't want it. If I get a drip, it's coming from this, you know, I'm going like this and then it drips like a thicker thing like that. So you have to be careful about it. I, I, and also I like these like handles like this. I feel that it gives me a kind of a more even coating too sometimes. I don't know why, but um, yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, you get them at Blick. Okay. I got the, I got a three pack of uh, the triple thick one time and it was like, I don't know, it was like, it was crazy. It was like $9 or something like that for three cans. For some reason, I've always found the triple thick to be cheaper than like the UV um, resistant uh, clear or something like that, or even the Krylon crystal clear or spray fixative. I don't know why, but the triple thick was, it was really inexpensive. I, mean, I think I checked on it fairly recently and I think it was still pretty inexpensive, you know. But I don't use it too often because I'm not, you know, a lot of times I don't want some kind of big slathering of uh, sealant over the tops of my, uh, you know, cardstock styles of uh, cards. So, yeah. All right. <clears throat> anyway, glad you like the uh, the grayscale, Sharon. It's certainly a, you know, fun and easy way to, to work. I really like the... Uh, All the grayscale pieces from this week, this one right here was like an experiment just using the hybrid ink on that uh, piece. But see, this is probably what I, I would frame my, mat my uh, piece like that onto, you know, a piece of the silver like this. I think that would look really cool. But yeah, all these grayscale pieces like this, you know, it's an easy way to work and it could be still, you know, nice and dramatic and everything like that, but it's, um, it's a lot faster uh, to do than uh, color. <laughs> I don't know. So think about that lighting again, you know, light source up here and reflected light down here, just two areas of light, okay? And you can do that for a lot of different scenes, you know, this one right here is light source up here, you know, that's been additive as opposed to, you know, something that's defined through darkness this one is you know added in here on this piece right here but you know instead of having this big area of light down here light source light source and divided by um some darkness in between like that you know so i just have a little bit of light here light here and light here and nothing in between there so it's the same type of thing though you just have an area that's kind of illuminated down there and that can be a, like a really easy lighting scheme for you and it's just made so much more apparent sometimes when i think when it's like grayscale you know like that so anyway thanks for joining in everyone i hope you had a good time here checking out the scenes i really like the uh all these rocks down here, you know, that's the types of things that I kind of forget about uh, if I haven't used, um, you know, that uh, clay board in a while um, using that. See, I can't, you know, I can't do that. Like, I can't get that type of like subtle type of uh, um, lighting on some of these types of things. If I'm doing an additive type of process, you know, I'm not going to get that like subtle type of transition with a, you know, uh, acrylic paint pen usually. I mean, you can get pretty good, you know what I mean? But it's just a little bit different. So if you want to go for some kind of like softer textures or something like that, you know, try this out right here. It's really fun. And, you know, when I used to teach this in my classes, um, there was something that went on in every workshop. I don't know if Harold Linder is still there, but, um, you know, usually when... Um, in the first classes, you know, I mean, everyone's, you know, busy doing things and, you know, they're talking and things like that. But when people started doing those subtractive marks on here, it happened every time. It was like silent in there. And I had a feeling that was like, I think it, I was convinced that it, people access a different hemisphere or their brain or something like that when doing a subtractive process, you know, when they're thinking about kind of like negative space or something like that. And it was almost like, it felt like even if class was like 20 people in there, you know what I mean? It just suddenly, there was like, you can hear a pin drop and everyone was working in there. It felt like, um, I don't know, like a, like a form of like meditation or something like that for everyone. So it was 
definitely a different spirit um, when doing that portion of the of the you know of their scene that they were doing too and we we did, all did different scenes too we didn't do um the same scenes back then because people had a choice of they can choose whatever stamps they wanted to and they would do it so you know people were hitting it at a different times so um yeah that's what i that's what the, that's one of the things i noticed so you can um do your uh you can come out of it in a nice relaxed meditative state <laughs> Um, all these pieces and others like it you didn't highlight like you normally do on these ones right here linda i didn't do too much highlight on this one but you know i was doing it with the uh the pen. i would do i would probably hit it with a little bit more of a like a paint pen thing but i wanted to get to this one that's why you know too or if you mean on this one right here um, yeah, a little bit of a different sensibility when you're working with, you know, a subtractive process and you can get, you know what I mean? Normally if I'm doing, um, highlighting with this, it's an additive process. Now I, I'm getting into a little bit more sketchy types of things, but inevitably I'm applying white into my scenes with this pen. But the thing about it, when I'm digging into layers of black and revealing white, I'm not necessarily thinking white on here. I'm thinking, okay, I want to get, if this is like a 80% gray right here, I'm thinking, okay, here I'm revealing, here's a 70% gray. How does that look? Do I want to go more or do I want to transition a small part of that 70% gray and go 50% or something like that? So... It's, I don't know, it's more of like a gradual type of, uh, you know, process like that. Yeah, it's a, little, I don't know, it's a little bit of a different sensibility. It's more, it's more varied and, uh, oh, what, maybe malleable in terms of the look you can get. So, yeah. I, all these things, I, I tend to forget about all this, you know, if I don't do these things for a while, though. That's how Bonnie gets when she colors. Yeah, okay. Bonnie gets in the in the into the zone. The color, the color, um, the like runners get. You get into that uh, runner. I was talking to someone that went goes running. She says you get that runner's high. Maybe you get that uh, coloring high, Bonnie. <laughs> I got the uh, uh, whatever the highlighting uh, highlight. I got into the highlight zone. <laughs> Yeah, with a white pen. Yeah, that additive process is different, uh, Linda, than that subtractive one. Now, this one took me a little bit of time to get in. And I've done a lot of these in the past, but when I hit that, um, when I was doing that little thing with that, um, with the fiber brush, it felt different to me, too, than when I was going in there with the scratch knife, okay? When I hit the scratch knife and was doing those, like, really specific little things... It's like, okay, that came back to me there. So think about that too, you know what I mean? It's like you're using these different types of tools that do different types of things um, on the pieces. Maybe that's a little bit different too than um, working on a like a white piece of cardstock with a traditional stamping media too. I don't know, I'm just thinking out loud here. I don't know for sure. Uh, but that whole subtractive thing definitely occurred to me back when, you know. Um, and I do think that there's something to it. You know, it's like there's this different, you use different parts of, there's this thing called uh, drawing on the right side of the brain too, where, I don't know, people do things and you flip it upside down and you're doing something upside down and you're looking at the form because you're no longer thinking of these things as like specific objects and you see the forms I, I think there's something to the subtractive thing, you know, and removal rather than um, something kind of additive too. So I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if one part's like, you know, right brain, one's left brain or something like that or something of that sort. But um, I don't know. You can, uh, if you start hurting on the, like one part of your head when doing it, then, you know, that's probably what's happening. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Okay, thanks for joining in, everyone. If 
anyone has said anything that's checking this out on the Facebook live stream, I'm sorry, I, I can't see the Facebook, you know, um, comments as uh, live, but um, I'll go back and I'll, if anyone's mentioned anything, I'll respond on uh, that platform. But um, anyway, I hope, uh, you know, uh, these maybe unconventional stamping surfaces, I've mentioned this before, I've been using this one for months now, but, um, you know, try some different types of surfaces that are out there and uh, it's really fun uh, to do um, not just look at the uh, crafting styles of uh, surfaces um, but maybe look into the uh, I don't know whatever you know look into the uh, art sector for certain things like that there's these boards like this the cradle panels are this is a box here okay and you put your own there's hinges that are included in here but this right here is a piece of the it's probably the same size as this yeah this is the size right here this is the board right here but it's on this lid right here okay and here's this box so if it was just this lid they would call that a cradled panel um you know, coming out from the wall, you know, where you can hang it on your wall or something like that. This right here is the deep cradled clay board. Here's like a square. And see this part right here? And then you have this, you know, it's a deep cradled one. So you can stamp out a scene on here. And then this kind of, you know, you can hang this on the wall or this can sit somewhere like on a, you know, on display or something like that. And it, it's bare sides. So what I do is I take like a wood stain and I stain the sides of it, you know, with whatever color you want of stain. I usually just keep it natural. And then I like to spray seal the sides of it too. So that's really fun. And I've shown these before in other um, types of things, but um, here's like that panel right here. Here's the square one right here. But there's my scene stamped in stamp board. And see, all, I don't know if you can see all my little scratches kind of going. There's a movement to the scratching like right in there. And that's, you know, doing those little, you see those little scratches in there? So I was scratching like directionally. I don't know where my scratch knives here went like this, but um, so I was doing all this type of thing like this, and then I was going like this in here, right in here, okay, and then spray seal it off. Looks like it has a warmer tinge to it. I probably put a little bit of a uh, back then it would have been peach Bellini, I think, ink, and then here's my stained sides right here, and then this in here. I don't know what this is right here. Secret note to myself, but the four by four inch, or no wait, three and a half by three and a half or something. I don't know, whatever those sizes, square ones. And they still have all this stuff out there, but you can do um, pieces in here. And that was like a coaster set that you can, you know, made for a kind of a cool gift or something like that. You can have your stack of coasters in here, you know, and that's all, you know, made possible with the, uh, you know, the clay board kind of a, uh, you know, whatever the, you know, the surfaces, you know, and uh, whatever products that are available out there, you can do all kinds of fun things with it. But the nice thing about it is that surface itself is meant to, you know, accept as many different types of media as possible, you know, which means that anything that I know of in uh, stamping, you know, it, it's a, it, it's a, it's easy for it to, uh, to, uh, to, to, transfer on and adhere to that and then you can do whatever you want to you can totally slather you know um sealant over it if you want to like i do so yeah all right thanks everyone good night uh if anyone has any questions about any of these things drop me a note there's i haven't taken it down I, we don't sell it on the stamp you know the stampscape site anymore but i do have that stamp board section up there that's what they called the uh, the smaller pieces for a while 
in there, but there's a bunch of different examples and there's a few lessons up there. There's like inchy little scenes too that are up there in the gallery. And uh, yeah, I don't know. There's a few different types of uh, things that are answered. I don't know. I think I said, I think there's even a what is stamp board or something like that on there if you ever want to know. All right, folks. Thanks again. Uh, always great to see you.